When the doctor came out and delivered me, my dad gave him um, my Renee Henry, you know, because he had to send it into Idaho. Mm -hmm. So he just put, and they named me after a French silent person actress. My mother and dad had seen a silent, every oh, thing really? was silent movies. Uh -huh. And they had seen, <laughs> and then he got up in church and blessed me, Jane Renee Henry. And so the credit union insisted that we match with our, our card, you know. Uh -huh. And so that's why it got changed. So now I'm Jane R. Henry down at the credit union. Huh. Interesting. So it goes on and on. <laughs> when we uh, grew up, we didn't have electricity or anything in our home. Yeah. Till I was about six, maybe. Wow. And when I could remember those men that, um, the men that came to put the telephone poles in and the poles, you know, to hold the wiring. and. Uh, and that man uh, gave me the red flag that you put on the poles to take them from one place to the other. Oh, yeah. I was so thrilled. I was <laughs> sorry. <laughs> After Mother died, one well, it's hard for, you know, all of us kids. And so I was up to my friend's house, Shirley, who just passed away this week. And uh, her mother was up working in the kitchen, and we were we were playing in the front room, and and we were talking, and I I uh, we were talking about church, about prayer, and I so I d I just told Shirley that I didn't pray, and then I said I prayed so hard that I thought. The Lord would answer a nine-year-old's prayer, and I, and I thought that Mother would live, and uh, and it was then that her mother came in and said, "Renee, let me talk and tell you about it." She said, "You know, there there has to be two answers to prayer," and she said, "With your mother, the Lord did answer the prayer, but the answer was no." So from then on, it was okay to pray. You know, our dad raised us because our mother was gone. Time we were little kids. And he was just a good example, you know, while he was raising us, he was a bishop. But Terrell Billy had only seen twice. A single bishop. A single bishop. Yeah. When we tried to thank him after we left home, he said he he would just say I, all I did was see you grow up he said I didn't do anything <laughs> yeah so uh, he was kind of that way about it we were a quarter of a mile from our nearest neighbor oh wow and uh, we lived on, on on the side of Whitney President Benson lived a mile and a half from Oh, uh -huh. the, the apostle was the president of the church. Uh -huh. About a mile and a half of us. In fact, my older sister used to attend those dancing kids. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So you went to school. Um, there, you, there was a, a schoolhouse there, and was it in Egypt or Whitney? Egypt. Egypt. Okay. We were in Egypt. Okay. Mm -hmm. And did you go there all through like elementary school? Is that how it worked? Yeah, we'd go from the first grade through the eighth grade. Okay. And then we would go to Preston for the high school grades. Okay. We were rough guys. <laughs> you know, when the when they'd bring the bus from town and they'd start to go everywhere, we'd play. Uh, girls and boys would play flag football and all those games and then we had a um, ball diamond so we did that a lot dad dad taught us all how to because dad had uh, 
he had played baseball in high school and he was good at baseball and uh, so he taught us all how to to bat and things like that. He didn't want us going to school batting like a girl. <laughs> so he taught us all that. But we had all these games that we'd play across the road and what it would be if you could go out and circle just a couple of people and get them in your, we called it mush pot. So in the winter time, we played games like that because the snow was really, you know, would be high. We'd, we'd have to make a trench-like thing that you could run into to be protected in the game. <laughs> and, so, and so we did have games like that. And then when, when it was snowing too hard, we had one room in that big schoolhouse that we had a basketball and could do things like that inside. The family had moved in this house the day that Pearl Harbor was bombed. And so Aunt Leah, I found out this week, just this week, I called Sherry and found out what street she was on and how many miles she was from the bombing. And she would have been seven miles from the bombing on a hill opposite where that bombing took, Pearl Harbor bombing. If we'd been working out in the beats or whatever we were doing, he'd take us over to what's called Hannah's in Preston because it was an ice cream shop. Oh, yeah. and it was a fun shop that you could go in and get anything you wanted there. And uh, I can remember my my uh, friend Ben. He came to my to my place, and he had two bananas. We weren't able to buy bananas during the war, and he had two bananas. And we went over to Hannah's and had a banana split. You couldn't have a banana split during the war, so it was it was interesting that way. Yeah, Valdine, he was right behind me in school, in high school and stuff. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was two years younger than I was. Okay. And then... And, and Colleen was five years younger than I was. Okay. We were the three, you know, on the end. Uh -huh. And then Montana was just two years older, and, and Marjean would be in, well, Marjean was the age of Fern. Oh, okay. They were in the same grade okay. in school. When you were in a play or something and had to stay late to practice, and, and then we'd walk out to Mutual, out to the ward, to Mutual, and, and it wasn't that far. You know, I told you about the time the Milton was behind me, and I'd run, and then he'd run. <laughs> Scared me to death. <laughs> and we got clear to the almost, well, we were about two blocks from the church when he finally caught me, and he said, what are you, <laughs> what are you running so hard for? And I thought, oh, I'd rather walk home with you than anybody I know. <laughs> He was a good basketball player, so he, that's what he's had to stay for. Oh, okay. And I, I had to stay for uh, play practice several times. So I was a cheerleader oh. with Tommy Kershaw. Yeah, they, were, they just had two of us, you know, me and Tommy Kershaw. Those are the only we were the only two cheerleaders. Really? Oh. Yeah, and then we had a song leader, uh -huh. and he ended up being one of the 70. Oh, well, I told you about the one dance that my dress got torn. Yeah. And the kid had to 
the in the last when that boy stepped on it why the boy I was dancing with grabbed the skirt and the top and danced to where the lady could sew me up again. <laughs> and and he said and he was a really good dancer, the fellow I was with. And, and he said, You'll laugh about this Sunday. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> The other night, I had a nosebleed, my first one since I was in high school. And I have to tell you about the one I had <laughs> in high school. Anyway, I was in the play Pride and Prejudice, and we were putting it on the very next day. And so my neighbor was doing my hair and ringlets, which was for that time. <laughs> ran off our little hill that we had that our uh, house stood on and for some reason I turned around and looked back at the house because it was dark and well I I hit into our fence which was a barbed wire fence and I went clear down the post the post knocked me out I, I thought it was strange because I could see the pictures of when you're knocked out of a ring and another ring in the pond. You know, I had um, a dress on and I could, when I came to, I could feel the blood running down in my dress that I had on. Yeah. When I went in the house, uh, Dad just, oh, he, he just beside himself and he, he told Valdine, my brother, to go get a towel because it had cut my nose right off, right on, along the bottom of my nose. And then I had a cut over my eye. And uh, so it was, I just looked a mess when I got in the house. Dad got right on the phone and called uh, Dr. Cutler over in Preston and told him what had happened and the doctor said we'll come right over and and he was the best doctor dad could have gotten for that purpose because he was so good to stitch people up he did a really good job uh, sewing sewing my nose back on and and uh, i have to look really to see what he did but my next problem was going to school the next day. All banged up, I was in that play for the young kids for the afternoon, Pride and Prejudice, and then, then I had to be in it for nighttime for parents and all of those people to come. And I, I was hiding out in the bathroom, <laughs> worried, worried about it. and. And our, the lady that taught uh, that kind of thing up there then, she was a go-getter. And she said, don't worry about it. She said, I think after I get you all made up, you'll be okay from the stage, you know, so you'll be okay. So I didn't worry about it. Uh, the fellow I was going with at the time said, you don't look so bad, don't worry about it. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, so I was in that play, and then, then I was in the nighttime play, and uh, I just all of a sudden, when when everything was over and I was all through doing that, I just went hysterical out of my mind. I just lost it, you know. So that was my biggie thing in high school. Yeah. What happened right after high school? Were you working somewhere? No, I I came down to Utah State. Mm. We uh, lived on Canyon Road and I also uh, worked in Preston. I worked for the telephone company. So much of our school, you know, revolved around that 
Maestro Lore. We had a lot of soldiers there one day on our park. And uh, if you'd sold so many war bonds or whatever, why then you got to ride in a Jeep with them. And then Preston had two Congressional Medal of Honors people. And the man that presented those on the park, and that's when I was working up there, and I, you could just walk out my door down out to the parks. So on my lunch hour, I would go to those. And uh, and anyway, he, he just made the comment, it's very unusual for a, for your city to get, have two Congressional Medals of Honor. Yeah. And that's just the kind of people we had up there. Marjean was on a mission, and uh, then when she got home from her mission, Hoy Valdeen had to go with the service. They still had that going from the Second World War. He was stationed in Germany for two years, so he couldn't go on a mission. And so Dad had me go on a mission. So when, when it was just about time, well, it was almost time for Marjean to get home because they told me that, uh, they said, if you want to see your sister, why watch for her in Dallas, Texas, because the train will stop there for, before you go on into Houston where the mission home was. So. So that's what we, Marjean and I saw each other for a half hour in Dallas. So your, your family was a missionary family? Well, yeah, mother went on one, dad went on one, yeah. Wow. Which, in those days, not every man went on a mission, right? Like it was... No, it was just hard to make a living. It would have been hard for people to send their kids on missions because they needed them to work on their farms and things. It was just hard to go leave everything. And our neighbor, uh, I heard them talk about his mission. And while he was out, he uh, he just ran out of clothes, garments, and things. And and what he had to do was just his garments were in rags, and he just had to wrap them around and tie them on his body to wear his garments. I mean, you were living in those kind of days. What happened was Brother Smith, his name was Ross Smith, his wife, you know, was ready to be baptized. But he couldn't believe in modern day prophets. That was hard for him even though he had read the Book of Mormon and even started in the Doctrine and Covenants. And he couldn't believe that, so I prayed all day. And I thought of the Nephi who prayed that the signs would come so the people wouldn't be killed. And, and I thought, if you can pray all day for something, that will help you. So I did. I prayed all day that uh, you know, that we'd know what to do and he'd be touched by it. And we had to walk. I, I'll bet the dirt came up to here. They'd plowed up all these fields to make little homes for these pilots and things to live in. And so we were walking through. Oh, I can remember one part we walked through it. It had, we come across uh, a big, a big snake. It was about that big a lion. It was a rattlesnake. But it was dead, you know, because they had plowed the field. So anyway, but I had prayed all day that we could reach this Brother Smith. And so, and I'd read the history. I took a history of, of the church with me, uh, written by a story, and he's still here in my bookcase. And I had read that history of 
the beginning of the church and Joseph Smith and and so I gave the lesson and I bore my testimony that he was a prophet of God, you know, that he couldn't have read couldn't have done what he did. He couldn't have received this kind of revelation had he not been a prophet. The Spirit of the Holy Ghost was right there in the room, you know, and it was like we had another person bearing testimony with us. And that's what convinced him. And he said he had to be a prophet. He had to be a prophet. When we'd go to her house, why she'd just want us to read. Because uh, she, she couldn't read the Book of Mormon. And and anyway, she was so interested in that. And when they transferred me and my companion to another whole area, the person was a sister street that they transferred to our area, and I told her about it. Mm -hmm. And her, her brother was a blind uh, lawyer in Salt Lake. And he immediately sent her a Book of Mormon in Braille. And that's how the Lord takes care of things. Wow. Isn't it? That's neat. That's yeah. really cool. Were you out in the in that mission at the same time Grandpa was out there? Yeah, part of the time. He went home quite a while before I did. So did you is that where you first met Grandpa? Was on the mission? Yeah, we worked in the office at the same time. Oh, okay. But that mission president was horrible. He was trying to match people up. He came in one day, he went out doing dishes, and he said, Sister Henry, you ought to treat Brother Hen Elder Henry nicer. You know? So <laughs> he was a matchmaker. <laughs> so what, what did you think of Grandpa when you first met him well, in the office? Well, he really, uh, he's the one that got the Anderson plan, because he knew, oh. you know, and that made such a difference to us. Yeah. And he, he, toured, uh, he toured the mission with Brother McConkie. We moved into a house right across the, from the school, down at Wilson School. Uh -huh. And uh, Henry's lived here then, you know, when we got married. Uh -huh. And anyway, uh, and that that wasn't a bad place to live. And my friend that I told you about that are going, his grandson's going to have the triplets. Uh -huh. They live next door to me on over on First North, mm -hmm. and we became such good friends. Well, we still are. And uh, but anyway, we went through a lot of things together over there. She and I, all of our kids were born within two weeks of each other. So Grandpa, he was only in the Navy during World War II. Uh -huh. And then after you were married, he was in, did he serve in the Army? Is that where No, he yeah. Uh, they actually had to sign up to serve longer. Oh, okay. And so that's what that, and so he was in, uh, when Shauna was born, he was in Fort Lee, Virginia. And anyway, it was funny because uh, my dad sent him a telegram but didn't tell him what he had because you didn't know what, what he had then. He said, Mother and baby doing fine. And that was a telegram he got out in the field <laughs> when he was training. Uh -huh. So he didn't know he had a show on until he got home. But I was going to have Gary up there in Preston too. And uh, then his turned out to be you know, so hard. That was my only hard labor. Why they have uh, what, mirrors in hospitals, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the doctor came in and, and told Dad, my poor dad was there again, because he's. He said, tell Ivan, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> this is hard. <laughs> He's too old for this, probably, yeah. huh? Yeah, he had done that five times with his own kids, you know. Uh -huh. But anyway, uh, and I did. I looked, I looked 45 years old, and I was 25 when I got wow. delivered. I delivered Gary, but and he was covered with little marks. They had had to go in and and turn him with the machine so he can be born. And then your mother had put Vaseline in her hair, and she was just stringy all over. And Marjane had washed her hair four times. <laughs> she couldn't get it out. And so, and that's how we left the hospital. But Ivan was better. See, he had, had to have emergency surgery up here. When Gary was born? When Gary was born. That's oh. why that went down like it did. Oh. It, it, Grandma Henry's the sweetest little lady that ever was. But she started to cry when she came up to the hospital to see me. Because it was such a mess. Yeah. <laughs> And I took him, I had to take him up to the hospital. Uh -huh. And then Grandma Henry came to stay with your mom. Okay. We, she had her own little doll buggy with her dog and uh -huh. with her doll in it. And she said, don't cry, baby. Daddy will be home with the ba brand new baby butter. Because <laughs> we tried to tell her that, you know, we were going to have another baby. <laughs> and it was so cute and pitiful. <laughs> Pushing her little kid across the the carpet. So my mom and Gary were born in Preston. Uh -huh. What were Cordell and Lynn born there? Down well? here. They were, in they were born here. Okay. You know, no, where I've been worked, why he, uh, we had insurance. You know, for those two kids. Okay. Down here, uh, the insurance thing hadn't started almost. I paid sixty-five dollars in Preston for those two deliveries. Really. The time you moved down here and, and we had insurance and stuff, it went from 65 to 400. You know, that's when it started to go up, up. To, Interesting. Yeah. And then, uh, Lynn, I wasn't in there long enough. I should have, they should have paid me. Because <laughs> I, Lynn was so fast. Really? Yeah. Was, how did Cordell's delivery go? Cordell was my only quiet, soft person. Really? <laughs> the, only thing, the only thing that bothered me was they picked, you know, it was the old hospital land. It's not the one they've got now, but oh. they had come to pick up the garbage and then put in the garbage cans and clutter. Cordell came. He was really... He's still that way, isn't he? <laughs> he is. Cornell's so quiet. Calm, collected. Yeah. <laughs> quiet person. Yeah. yeah. And you had, and Grandpa was there to help with Cordell and, and Lynn. Yeah. He was around. <laughs> yeah, he was there. That's good. But, he, he <laughs> but when I had Lynn, you know, and you couldn't uh, take kids in the hospital then at all. You know, to look, look through the window or anything. And so when I had Lynn, my Ivan brought all the kids up. And I looked down and that poor little Cardell had pants on that I patched with. Uh -huh. You know, when, when spring had come, you'd make shorts out of long pants. And... <laughs> And he didn't have anything in the back of his legs because I had patched him. <laughs> I looked down at that poor little soul and thought, oh, I need to get home. <laughs>
Oh, we did family home evening for a scripture study or something. We went to San Francisco oh, really? and Grandpa crossed that bridge at least five times because <laughs> we'd turn around and come back across it. <laughs> I said, I we can't keep crossing. <laughs> and our kids, and in San Francisco is the Flower Children then and Market Street and all of that. And so uh, people just went crazy to see kids. Huh. No kidding, they, our kids waved out that camper room. Everybody waved at them. And, huh. <laughs> but anyway, we went in the big <laughs> department store and uh -huh. let the kids pick, you know, pick out something for school. And, yeah. So that was an interesting place. And, and we went and we took them to the zoo that they had up there. And uh, we took them to that other place where the dolphins swim in oh, California. Sea World. Sea World. We went to, took them to Sea World and we all, always took them to Yellowstone on Labor Day. We were always up in Yellowstone. Oh really? You'd always go on Labor Day? Yeah. Really? Well, on, the, on that, weekend, that weekend we had it all. You like to do in Yellowstone? Oh, we like to to go on their hikes, you know, and see their hot pots, that Gloria pool, and you know, we'd go all through, we'd go all through Yellowstone. I had one class of um, Laurel girls, had 12 kids in the class. And uh, that was one thing I, I just really enjoyed working with those kids and they were such good kids. And I was coming home after interviewing and a member of the bishopric caught me when I was halfway up that little road over there that goes to the church. And he said, we need to change you from the Laurel girls. You need to be in the presence of the young men, young women, you know, he said. And I can remember walking away from him and thinking, you know, you get a, you, you get a job you really like in the church and they come and take it away. <laughs> and they do that a lot. Did your kids all get along pretty well growing up? Were they good friends? We did. Yeah. They did. Uh, Cardell was so independent. He wouldn't, if he got caught in a storm, he'd walk home from school. Gary and Lynn, Sean always had to go get them. Really? <laughs> but she was good about it. Uh -huh. You know, they learned to depend on each other. Huh. When I had, when I had to go to work, and I did have to, and those kids, learn to depend on each other. Yeah. So they were, uh, they, my kids were always close. Uh, one night we had a wedding across town from people that the parents lived up a street. There's a street that takes up and goes off there. And uh, so uh, Lola and Zona, my two neighbors, had come to go with me to this wedding reception. And uh, and I was just making them turn out the driveway and I said, oh, you need to go get Sister Baxter. I said, she's lived at the end of her street. I said, we need to go over, over and get her. And she was blind and she was sitting right there when they knocked on her door, she was sitting there by the phone uh, with her new clothes on and her coat on, waiting for somebody to come get her. <laughs> and so, you know, when you have experiences like that or, or you lose your, the kids and you're close to the canal, I've had that happen. And uh, find the kids. And, so you can, you just need, you need this Spirit of the Holy Ghost with you all the time, I think.
got released from being in the, the singles for and then President Benson gave a talk about... And he gave the talk, he gave a talk in conference about how they were just begging for for senior people to go on missions. Yeah. And so, and they only had 1,200 couples out at that time. Really? That was good, we went out there. But we taught in so many more black homes. I was so thrilled <laughs> after what I'd seen in Texas to see that take place, you know. And the one Clara Hyman that we that had prayed for us to come to her place, she she just started to cry. Said, "Here, I prayed for you to come, and you brought me this extra." And we'd given she had a Book of Mormon and everything. But we we had one member of the ward that, uh, or the branch out there that worked at the prison, and mm -hmm. he had a young man that had had a horrible, and he was only in his late teens, mm -hmm. that had had a hard, horrible experience, and he asked us to visit that boy in prison, and we did that. And I guess that goes with the scriptures, and I was in prison, and you visited me. Sounds like you were driving quite a bit. And oh, we were. We got really acquainted with the m and drivers. He boy. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, he'd wave at us, and we'd wave back. <laughs> yeah. And then when, when it got so, Grandpa and I, could take two kids at a time and take them places. Grandkids? Yeah, we did that for years. We went over and rode the train between uh, Durango and uh, way up in the mountains there, Silverton, oh. in the Silverton Mountains. Uh -huh. They have a, a courthouse and everything. Uh -huh. And it's, uh, there are still old silver mines up there that oh, wow. people work in. So we'd take that train from Durango, clear up there, and that was fun. The kids yeah. got so they loved that. And we'd go to, when we'd go that way, we'd go to Mesa Verde. So we'd go clear through Mesa Verde and all of those Indian caves. Oh, wow. And so it was wonderful. I can remember just sitting out here one night, and I'd I'd put it because I could tell when he was going to have him, and I'd put a pillow on the floor and a blanket, and uh, <laughs> that's what. And we just sit here. I just have to sit here and watch. And in fact, I, in fact, I was all, up all night with him that night, and Cardell came to the back door and. And he said, Mom, go up and go to bed. So I went upstairs and slept for eight hours. That was a hard time. And for, you know, your mom felt like she was going to go. They helped Jonathan and Katie move up to the Northwest. And, uh, and she started to cry when they were leaving them and and I was, and then your dad said you know what's what's the matter and she just said well that's the last time I, I'll see those kids so for some reason she knew that that was going to happen yeah Ivan couldn't go down when she, your mom was so bad and uh, so LaRue and then my friend Claire came and stayed here with him all day. You know, we just heard she was in the hospital and she was bad. Paula took me down and uh, I just got a, a few minutes or just seconds almost and I'd heard people that were in a coma. I'd heard that they can hear even. So I was able to just hurry down to where she was in the hospital. 
and talked to her for just a few minutes and told her how proud we were of her because she had always just been such a good person, good girl. And so we came, I came home the next day and I needed to go get uh, something, uh, some groceries. And I was coming home right where you cross the street you should go up to River Heights. And I was coming home and I just started to cry. It's done control me and and I thought, well is that Ivan or is that Shauna? Hmm. You know. And it was your mother who died. And uh, his I got home and Gary was on the phone and he told me that she just passed away. And uh, and I couldn't tell that, I couldn't tell Ivan because she was always his little girl, you know, because we had the three boys bang, bang, bang and just had Shauna. And, uh, and I couldn't, it took me all day before I could tell him and he just cried and uncontrollably did. It was such a sad time. <laughs> and I can remember sitting by you and uh, at the, where they had her viewing, telling you that the Lord would send you special blessings. Then things got uh, harder with Grandpa, you know. And, and so the day he died, all all, all of my kids and their wives were all sitting by him here. Grandpa had a really hard time going. And it just kind of haunted me for a long time. And then uh, Mara, who has, who has dreams, she dreamed after Grandpa died, she dreamed that he hated to leave and leave me alone here. And uh, and so Gary said, you you better tell it, better tell Grandma. That would make her feel better because his death was so hard. It just bothered me. Cordell was so used to having to be here when I'd go shopping or somewhere to be with Ivan. And, <laughs> and so, so when Ivan died, Hoy Cardell was out there at the table and he said, well, now do you need to go get something for the funeral, you know? And then he thought for a minute and he said, well, Dad's not here anymore, is he? <laughs> he said, no, no, I don't have to, because I don't know, I couldn't have, I just couldn't have got along without Cardell. They all had their turns. People were really good to us, and and uh, and they still are. My neighbors are good to me, like Roy. will come and do my snow early in the morning, and they're just good to me. So I have no complaints in living here. How it was? It was really hard on Jenny when your mother died and uh, and little women were was down at the uh, show house you know and uh, so I took her and and uh, Amy down to to the show and she got so upset you know just sitting there and so I I was going to call your dad and tell him to come get get her because she just couldn't handle it and uh, and I'll, and then she came back in and she said grandma I think I'm okay I'll stay so she stayed to, for the show but that was a really hard time on her wasn't it that same year that you were diagnosed with cancer two two uh, two weeks after two weeks after Grandpa died. Uh-huh. And to tell you the truth, the very worst airplane, airport is Phoenix, Arizona. 
it? Don't ever go there. <laughs> Don't ever go there. <laughs> you know, you'd be in a whole different place or they had to go to the bathroom and things that they had announced. Phoenix or uh, Bakersfield, you know, and you'd have to run to a whole different part. I had this little ne uh, Mexican boy helping me. And he said, hang, out, hang on, we'll get you there. <laughs> so he did. What are some of the things that have brought you the most peace and, and joy throughout your life? Well, I, you know, I think the missionary work that we did. Off the top of your head, are there any, do you have any favorite scriptures? Oh, well, I like all of Alma. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm an Alma person. Oh, yeah. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And as we were riding up to those people's house, this scripture came into my mind. So it's always been my, one of my favorite scriptures because I've got an actual place where that happened.